Now, if the internet gods are good to us, uh, we're just about to introduce David Holmgren. So, um, David is best known as the co-originator of the permaculture concept. He and his partner Sue Dennett live at Meliodora in Hepburn, Victoria, one of the best known permaculture demonstration sites in Australia. David is respected uh, for his commitment to presenting ideas through, through, sorry, through practical projects and teaching by personal example. But a personal that a permaculture lifestyle is a realistic, attractive, and powerful alternative to dependent consumerism. As well as constant involvement in the practical side of permaculture, David is passionate about the philosophical and conceptual foundations for sustainability that are highlighted in his many books and writing. So, are you there, David? How is it in Meliodora? Hello. <laughs> so that's 5.99. Yeah. Five-star holding bikes. I wonder if we can get the video. <coughs> yep. Okay. Greetings from Hepburn Springs to everyone gathered at this IPC, which I'm confident will be a very well-organised event. Those of you who have read my essay, Why I Am Not Flying Much, will understand why I'm not there. <laughs> um, and of course, although I've been a trenchant critic of the downsides of fossil fuel globalisation, I really experience it as a privilege of the current era that I can contribute to the global meeting from a small village that might seem at the uh, end of the earth, at least from the perspective in London. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to reflect on how understanding the ebb and flow in the adoption of permaculture and it's spread over the last 40 years, uh, can inform our plans with permaculture in the future. And a future full of challenges uh, that can be turned into opportunities. The waves of adoption and spread of permaculture over the last 40 years have been strongly correlated with large scale geopolitical and economic cycles and events. And it's interesting that Permaculture One was, of course, published in 1978, bracketed between the oil crises of 1973 and 79, and strongly informed by the Limits to Growth work, uh, which was published by the Club of Rome in 1972. So there was a huge interest in what today we would call sustainability. And I'm very certain that if Permaculture One was published in uh, a decade later, uh, there might not have been the same interest. Certainly, I date the end of that first wave as being 1983, when the Hawke Keating government introduced the Thatcherite Reaganite uh, revolution, really, with a bit more of a human face in Australia. But a whole generation of environmental activists and politicos came to the conclusion that the limits of resources was not going to lead to a fundamental change in society. And there was actually a consolidation period uh, during that time in the interest in permaculture. It didn't expand very rapidly as the Western economies again grew. Now, the second wave, I really relate to the stock market crash of 87 and the IPCC being formed in 88 with the really formal recognition of um, uh, climate change. Of course, that was the same year that Mollison's encyclopedic 
designer's manual was published and there was a, a huge explosion of interest in permaculture in Australia and in many other countries around the world. Ironically, I date the end of that second wave of being the Rio Earth Summit of 1992, which uh, so many people uh, put so much hope in. By the late 1990s, I sensed a third wave wing, which had both the oppositional sides and the, uh, the, negative, uh, the positive sides as well. And my book, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, published in 2000, too coincided with that, but in a lot of ways that third wave was still born by the events of September the 11th. And uh, really the, it took to the GFC where we see this fourth wave which is now unfolding with after the peaking of conventional oil, the onset of real climate change and uh, economic contraction. So this history suggests that the future form of permaculture will sh be shaped more by these forces and than the desires and plans of individuals or organisations. So as the limits to growth crisis is unfolding, uh, the inevitable transition to re a renewable energy future in some form uh, holds a lot of uncertainties. If that transition follows the energy transitions of the past, the last 250 years, to higher quality, denser, more reliable energy, then I predict that permaculture will remain as an ethical or lifestyle choice of a minority in a conflicted but materially abundant world. Now, on the other hand, if uh, the renewable future is one of energy descent that I have described, then permaculture in principle, if not name, will become normalised adaptive behaviour for rediscovering our place in nature. So we might all have strong opinions about and hopes and fears about possible futures and how to shape them. But the necessary transformation, I believe, is as much an internal process as an external one. And I think seeing energy descent as an opportunity rather than a problem might just be the largest and most significant contribution of permaculture thinking to a prosperous way down for humanity. Thank you. As you can tell, David is a big thinker, and um, I really recommend you check out some of his books, uh, all of which you can find on his website, which is um, Holmgren, put in David Holmgren in Google. <laughs> okay, so um, great. Our next speaker is Professor Tim Lenton. Mm -hmm.